Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. Listen to AM560, The Answer online at 560theanswer.com on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. This is Chicago's Morning Answer. Merry Christmas. On AM560. Ho, ho, ho. The Answer. All right. Good Eve of Christmas Eve. Amy Jacobson here. Paul Vallis in for Dan Prop. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. And I know we talked earlier about Mayor Lightfoot's big public safety meeting and her plans. That's why I have formally asked the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland, to, with all deliberate haste, detail ATF agents to Chicago for six months so that we can increase the number of gun investigations and seizures in Chicago. And I I just kept wondering what what took so long. I mean, she mentioned the obvious, which we've been talking about here, that there's a lot of violent offenders out on electronic monitoring, rapists, convicted felons, people, you know, waiting to go to court on gun charges, attempted murder, first and second degree. Well, the Tribune did a story, well, the Wall Street Journal, I should say, did a story uh, last July where they said uh, that... uh, Fox had released three times the, or had failed to charge three times the number of individuals for, for serious violent offenses than her predecessor, and that there were like 72 percent of individuals who have committed serious offenses or have been gun charges, whatever, were, you know, were, were released or on, uh, on home monitors. And, and, and they did a snapshot of, um, I think they did July of last year over, over uh you know, uh, 10 years earlier, and there were like 3,500 out on home monitors oh, versus yeah. 500 versus 500. Well, right now, I think it's at 2,300. Here's, yeah. Mayor, here's yeah. Mayor Lightfoot. Right now, right now, ladies and gentlemen, Cook County criminal judges have let almost 2,300 offenders with these charges back onto our streets, in our neighborhoods, on our blocks. It simply defies common sense. A little late to the party, but... <laughs> a, li- a little late, if you remember. Trump offered to provide a lot of support. And he the did. Beef up, up, you know, uh, federal presence. Look, I mean, you know, sending a nasty letter to uh, to uh, Kim Fox, and I think Preckwinkle immediately, like, blew her off. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's not... I mean, let's face it. She, she is not doing all that she needs to do and can do to address the problem. All right, with more on this, let's welcome back to the program. It's been a few, a long time, but Alderman Tom Tunney, Alderman of the 44th Ward. Good morning, Mr. Tunney. How are you? Good morning, Amy and Paul. Good uh, morning. Nice to see you, actually, at the press conference, uh, Amy. And, of course, Paul and I talk on a regular basis. We do. So um, it was a uh, long speech and maybe long overdue, as you say. Well, so why were you invited? Because I noticed it was you and I think one other alderman, and that was it. Did she invite the entire city council? Um, I can't speak for who she invited, uh, but she did reach out to me, uh, you know, kind of last minute. But, you know, I don't know. I think there were a lot of aldermen there, but obviously a lot of us are on some kind of holiday break and traveling. But, uh, Amy, you know I travel from Lakeview to the restaurant and back to Lakeview. So <laughs> so what do you think was missing from her public safety speech or what, is there something well, else I you think, could have recommended? Uh, I don't know. I think, I think the, her initial remarks were that she lives and breathes public safety and has from day one. Now, uh, part of this, as you know, is a multi-pronged approach with federal, state, county, and local. And, and obviously, Uh, I know Paul and I have talked about this, is the actual number of police officers that are on the job, on duty, um, recruitment. Uh, I know the mayor is planning a a nationwide recruitment, but I think the morale um, and the health of our police officers, you know, are in jeopardy too. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's not a good time to be um, in in the Chicago Police Department. And I know I'm one of, of a number of aldermen that have been very supportive of the police over the over the years that I've been in uh, in office, and uh, certainly a big fan of what's happening in the 19th district. Albeit the carjackings and the robberies are 
uh, out, you know, they're out of control. Out of control. I mean, I, I went from knowing nobody to knowing three people who've been carjacked. And other people just keep their German shepherds in the front seat of their car in hopes that that will deter crime. But even after Alderman Smith, when he, you know, um, also on the city council, obviously, Alderman Smith, she had a, you know, take back the streets rally. After that, 14 people were robbed at gunpoint. And you can't even walk in pairs anymore or even groups of five because those people are getting, you know, stopped while they're walking down the street, gun to the head hand over the possession of their items. What, when is it going to stop? And how could it stop? Well, as you said, the mayor laid out a few, uh, a number of items, more resources um, on drug and gang enforcement. Um, she's also talked about um, the moratorium on these uh, electro electronic monitoring with the seven or so categories that she addressed that are obviously serious crime. Um, more police officers. I know our budget is fully funded, uh, but we're having a hard time recruiting um, and retaining um, officers. I think, as you know, Paul and I have talked about this mm -hmm. before. Those, those, we're losing some of our mid-level management to other municipalities. I know I lost a captain to uh, Oak Park. Another uh, one of the big uh, deputies downtown is is uh, running the Northbrook, Illinois. Department. So we've got to make sure that we invest in our officers and really give them the tools and the mental health and, and such. Um, we, we've got to put these people um, as our heroes, which they are. Yeah. Well, look, look, I, uh, Tom and I have talked from time to time, and I think there's, there's a few older men who are, or, who are more committed to supporting the police than Tom. But let me just make a couple observations. Uh, uh, it's tough to be a Chicago police officer today. The lack of public support, the scapegoating of cops constantly, and we can go through a litany from Popcorn Gate to the Bobby Rush thing to everything, all the way to the Toledo video where, it's, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the cops are under siege. You are 1,500 police officers short than when the mayor came in to public office, and the city has lost 950 officers, and and they're going to lose another 200, 225 after January when the police get all the retro checks. The department is in absolute free fall. And, and when you combine that, and incidentally, they're only replacing a fraction of those officers because they can't get people to apply. And I read where like 80 percent of those who did apply, the handful who did apply, failed the exam. So there's a real risk that they're actually going to be recruiting replacement officers who are not nearly of the caliber of the officers. So the department is literally in free fall, and there's no strategy to do that. And, and if the mayor, and I'll be honest with you, if the mayor wants to make a bold step, uh, show it's time, it's, it's time to follow what Alderman Cardenia said, it's time to get a new leadership team in there, because the rank-and-file cops have no faith in the first deputy and even less faith in the, the superintendent. I mean, this is a department... And, and despite the failure to fill vacancies, uh, Brown persists on this strategy to literally have a, a, about a thousand cops pulled from local districts to be part of this citywide shock and all unit and simply dispatching them from one hotspot to another as if the gangbangers and the thieves and the carjackers uh, are not mobile. So uh, the, scare, the whole scarecrow policing. So at the end of the day, it's just time. It's time to begin at the top and to and, and to admit that the strategy is not working and to demand that you go back to what interim superintendent Beck laid out when he was brought in to be the interim superintendent. The strategy of pushing as many police officers as possible down to the local beats so that you've got beat integrity so that you've got the officers lo working closest to the population. And I think that's a strategy that needs to be em embraced, but it's not going to be embraced with Brown. It's not going to be embraced with his leadership team. So you got to begin to make changes at the top to admit that you've made a mistake and she's never going to do it. Well, right. Paul, Paul, you know, I feel about the, the beat integrity we've in the 19th district, uh, we've lost a, a, a lot of our mm. officers. When I, uh, a couple of years ago, under the under Rahm uh, Emanuel, we were up to almost 400 officers in the 19th district. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're hovering under just under 300. Oh God, so you're terrible. talking about a 25 percent loss. Yeah. And uh, but you know, and and I'm not going to. Uh, I want to talk about a couple other things, Amy. You know, um, I know that uh, technology is playing a, a more important role than ever in the police department. 
I know that she talked about uh, um, license plate readers uh, in, uh, doing a lot more in that effort in order to try to track, um, obviously, deadbeat uh, uh, individuals and stolen cars. Uh, also, um, I know Alderman Riley and I and others along the lakefront have talked about uh, helicopter cover um, coverage. Um, you know, I just think that, um, you know, and I, I know we've talked about this. We had a beat meeting uh, last night, uh, night before last, and, you know, they're talking about the fact that um, they just, you know, the, the whether it's the court system or the police, the police are arresting, but they're really not prosecuting. And that doesn't help the morale uh, either. Um, you know, we're not actively doing chases uh, with, uh, with um, stolen vehicles yeah. unless, unless there is, you know, gun activity of sorts. So, you know, there's just a, you know, the police are, have, have one, one hand tied behind their back, I think. And Paul and I would agree on yeah, that also. Absolutely. And you know what Paul pours salt on the wound, the people that I know that were carjacked? Because when they recover their car, because normally they recover their car, they have to pay the pound fee to yeah. get it out. Think about that $150. for a second. All right. Well, I wanted to move on to the vaccine mandate that, uh, you know, all bars and restaurants and gyms have to require proof of vaccine for five-year-olds on up or else they can't eat at your restaurant. Are you really going to kick out a five-year-old child who just wants to have some cinnamon buns? Well, uh, Amy, that's, you know, we're in the service business, right. you know, and we're open to the public. That's the mantra that we've all got into this business for. And, um, you know, I think there still needs to be more information because we're hearing a lot from our parents that have, you know, under 12 years of age, um, you know, they're just not comfortable with the efficacy of the data um, coming out about uh, this early inoculation so for these very young kids. So, you know, I've reached out to the mayor really and to get some more data, and I, I know she's providing that to me for these 5 to 11-year-olds um, because, you know, I, I heard I, I spent some time last night with a constituent that says, hey, if, if I can't take my 7-year-old uh, out, um, you know, to the theater or to restaurants or to the museums, you know, we're going to be, we're, you know, we're going to be held hostage in our own home. Well, they can't and even go to McDonald's, feel, Tom. It's more than yeah, that. You can't go to feel food. that the evidence is there yet. But so I'm getting more information to, try to convey to my constituents. So, uh, there's some studies out there. What about RJ Melman? Where, where, where does everybody stand on this? Are you guys all together on this and the, the restaurant association, Sam Tafoya? I mean, what's going on? Well, you know, Sam Toy and I talk all the time. Um, you know, we just do. We're we're not uh, obviously totally opposed to to you know shutting these businesses down uh, like we did last year. Um, obviously, we're uh, we're doing a lot more uh, uh, on employee vaccinations and boosters, and um, we think that's the way to go. But um, you know, you know this better. I you know this as well as I do, Amy. Restaurants have been struggling for a couple of years now, oh, right. and with help, uh, with mandates, um, you know, it's it, it's these are un, uh, unprecedented times. Also, you know, it's uh, um, it it is a scary time to be in small business. I'll tell you that. Well, why is there no pushback against the mayor? Like collectively, if you guys all formed a solidarity and said, "No, mayor, we're not going to do that," because first of all, you know, it might not be any of our business, and if they choose to eat. You know, we've been eating. New York City did this. They, they've been having this vaccine mandate in place since August 3rd. Their numbers are just as high as ours, so it proves that it's not working. And then you're going to have a business compliant investigator come by and write you a ticket for anywhere from two to $10,000. Do you know how many business compliant investigators there are? Because there's a lot of restaurants in Chicago. Well, Amy, you know that I... Uh... I got a ticket uh, for indoor dining last mm -hmm. year. That's right. You know, and but uh, I, you know, I, it. I think that the fear of most restaurants is that they are actually going to shut you down. And uh, you know, the, the city has a lot of uh, uh, tools. And of course, you know, the public is the is the number one, you know, complainer. If they see something that they think is is uh, not accurate, it takes a three one one call and. Uh, 
you know, you're going to be inspected sooner than later. Well, you know, the problem is when you work the public into a frenzy, like they've done at school, scaring the hell out of people thinking that sending your kids back to school is a life or death situation. This is the reaction and the response you get. You know, you cross the border into Indiana and we seem to be exporting everything from Indiana, except, of course, uh, ex- I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, you uh, Indiana seems to be thriving and prospering. Yes, everybody's dealing with the the upsurge. Uh, you know, the Omicron may be another one of those quick upsurges and basically then suddenly the downsurge. And it doesn't seem to be hospitalizing uh, uh, as many people or at least the but percentage of people. It, but the point is that uh, other states seem to be managing the process really well, except the, some of the bluest of blue states like Illinois, and New York and others. And it's it's really having a devastating impact on not only the service industry, but also a devastating impact on on working families, particularly poor black and Latino families who are being adverse impacted the most. This is the Democratic Party's constituency, and they're the ones who are getting punished. Alderman, are you there? Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Well, I'm, yeah, not, sorry. I'm, not sorry about that. I'm not disagreeing with Paul. You <laughs> know, and, and by the way, most of the uh, service jobs in, in Chicagoland area are black and brown uh, workers, too. Yeah. And uh, part of that is the the, w- the wages keep going up and, you know, businesses can't always pass on their uh, price increases either. Yeah. You know, well, maybe uh, I've got a pie chart that you could bring the mayor if you ever talk to her. It shows about spread mm-hmm. and the most spread. It's not at restaurants or bars right. and gyms are less than one percent. Schools are non-existent. The same thing with schools. Yeah, non-existent. And let me point out to the public out there, you know, when they say, oh, my God, 134 or 140 or 150, whatever the number of districts have an outbreak. I mean, what's the what's the what's the, the definition of standard? an outbreak is yeah. two. Yeah. So in other words, if if you're at Lane Tech, where what's the enrollment? Forty two hundred. And you have like two, three, four, five people. That's an outbreak. Oh, my God. There's an outbreak at Lane Tech. Let's start quarantined. So, well, here's what here's what I know is the mayor, uh, the mayor's health commissioner has been a real asset to her. She's an epidemiologist. Um we did uh, prior to COVID. They did a uh, they did a um, a whole exercise on this kind of pandemic coming to the city, um, and I know that she uh, relies heavily on uh, on the advice of the, the health Dr. commissioner. Warden, and, yeah. and sometimes uh, sometimes I think she has an overweight in regards to uh, measuring the uh, costs and benefits. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I I just know that I think she's a good commissioner. I think she was the right person at, at, and, and continues to be. But as the mayor, you got to weigh the science. Right. you got to weigh the economy. you got to you got to do a, a, a multi, multitude of decision making uh, for the best interest. And sometimes I think health rules the day and uh, the rest uh, be darned. All right. We're going to let you go here. But I have one more question from a listener. Ask uh, Tom Tunney, what are retailers to do when security guards are beaten up? Because last night at on Oak Street at Hermenez and Prada's, at Hermenez, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong because I'm not a fancy shopper, <laughs> Tom, um, but he was he was pepper sprayed. But if they shoot back, will they get immunity if they shoot? Look, Amy, um, you know, one of the issues that, that uh, Alderman Riley and Hopkins passed is, uh, you know, uh, SSA for private security for the retail district, uh, Michigan Avenue and Oak Street and such. So, um, you know, the mayor has been pretty uh, uh, forefront about um, private security for these affluent districts. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, to answer specifically the question, I, I'm not, I'm not a a law enforcement person, but I know a lot of retail has their private security there. I've, I've never, I've never seen as much, not just obviously in Michigan Avenue, but, uh, but also in the neighborhoods. Um, they've got to protect their uh, inventory. One other thing about that issue is, you know, uh, revisiting the, the felony charges for retail theft. Uh, you know, that number used to be 300. I think it went to 1,000. And I know that I think 
Um, our state's attorney is rethinking that policy, but I, yeah, you know, let me. I hope so because they're doing it in San Francisco. Yeah, let me make a quick comment, and, and we're not beating up on you. You have been really at the yeah, forefront, thank you for and, coming on. and you do it in kind of a low key fashion, but effective fashion. I think that's what makes you an effective alderman. That's why you continue, <laughs> despite uh, some political opposition from time to time, returning to office with a very healthy margin. The uh, uh, you know. There's an ordinance, and, and and tell me what the status is. It was Napolitano's ordinance. Basically, what Alderman Napolitano wanted to do was introduce an ordinance called the Nuisance Ordinance, at least that's how I characterize it, which would allow the city to really go after individuals who violate the public way. They come in, they damage public and private property, they push people around, they intimidate, they disrupt businesses, etc. They, they steal. So, so in other words, even if Fox is not prosecuting them, the police can come in, they can confiscate, they can take their, they can impound their vehicles, they can take the cell phones away, etc. Um, what's the status of that ordinance? Because, you know, sending a letter to Fox isn't going to do anything. Basically telling her not to release people or on bail or put, give, them, give them ankle bracelets if they've committed violent uh, felonies it is, is a, a prequel has already kind of like dismissed that out of hand. But what about doing something that is within your control? You pass Napolitano's uh, nuisance ordinance, and you you allow the city to get really aggressive about the mobs that descend upon downtown or other business districts within the city and simply wreak havoc. Paul, I haven't seen the the ordinance itself, but you and I have had this discussion. You know, the, the, the city, the city council you know, is moving to the left on these issues, you know, so interfering in the public way, you know, homelessness and um, other societal issues, um, you know, I think the council is more lenient than they've been uh, in the many years that I've been on the council. So the, uh, unfortunately for the probably the listeners of this yeah. program, the council is moving to the left. And, and I'm, I'm, as you know, very much in the center and more of a moderate voice on the council. All right, Alderman, thank you so much for joining us. Alderman of the 44th Ward, Tom thank you. Tunney. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Coming up on Chicago's Morning Answer, open mic Thursday on a Friday. You're pointing to something. I don't know. What Fauci. We're... Oh, Fauci's back on. Of course, he's a media ho. <laughs> um, we'll take your phone calls about your most memorable moments of 2021 and your New Year's resolutions, 312-642-5600. But now let's head into the newsroom. Bill Trefiro in for Mike Scott. Good morning. It's 36 degrees in Chicago. I'm Bill Trefiro on AM 560, The Answer. Two new studies suggest the Omicron COVID variant could be much less likely to lead to severe illness than the Delta variant. Researchers at Scotland's University of Edinburgh found Omicron's risk of hospitalization is two-thirds that of Delta. A study out of South Africa where Omicron first was detected indicates that people with Omicron infections are 80% less likely to wind up in the hospital than those who contract other strains of the virus. The University of Illinois is instituting a proof-of-COVID-19 